Welcome to the Half Blood Report. Here we discuss Percy Jackson news, interviews, and all things Riordan. I'm Samuel, your co host. And I'm Diego, your other co host. And this week on the podcast, we have a marvelous guest. Yep. Gracie Kim is the debut author of The Last Fallen Star from Rick Riordan Presents. Gracie, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me, guys. I can't believe I heard that intro live after hearing it so much. <laughs> Recorded. <laughs> Thank you. It it, it means I, a lot that that at least somebody listens yeah, to our podcast. You know, I, <laughs> I I can't believe that we actually record it a new time each episode, but we don't change it. <laughs> I love it. I mentioned it, it so earlier, cool. but I um I'm a huge fan of your podcast. Um, so much so that my husband even knows both your names, and um, yeah, yeah, it's very well versed all things half blood report because i play it out loud he said wow, to say hi that is that way. is such an <laughs> oh, honor oh. <laughs> wait we, we, we need to do a shout out no i'm so sorry i, I forgot from the reed Varden video what's your husband's name his name is neil okay neil this is a shout out uh, i don't know <laughs> hello neil <laughs> we're not good at that <laughs> he'll be so happy i'll play it extra loud for him <laughs> um <laughs> But, but getting, getting into the questions, you've you've been doing this virtual tour for a while now. How Very has that, that been going with you know radio shows and Zoom shows and crowdcast shows? <laughs> yeah, it's been good. It's been tiring. I won't lie. Some of the time differences have been a little rough. Oh yeah. Um, but it's all part of the fun, I guess. I did a radio uh, tour that started, I think, for me at two a.m. in the morning. Oh no, actually, no, that's not right. It was something else. It was at two a.m. in the morning. No, I did the radio tour that started at midnight and then ended at 5 a.m. <laughs> that was fun. Um, no, it was actually, it was quite fun. Um, a little bit of adrenaline that was involved in that. Um, and then I had a few hours nap after that ended in the morning. And then I had that um, launch event with Rick uh, like wow. a few hours later in the morning. So big day. But yeah, no, it's been awesome. In- incredible, really. That's that's crazy. So it's just... You start, you go to sleep, you wake back up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I wonder if, because so much of the yeah. promotion is, uh, you know, aimed for an American audience. It's it's published with Disney. It's it's Rick Riordan. Have you been doing any promotions, like specifically with New Zealand media outlets? Yeah, so good question. The book actually doesn't come out in New Zealand officially until like the 27th of July. <laughs> 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 so nothing yet. Um, everything has been virtual for the US but I hope I can do stuff locally because one of the things I was really upset about was not being able to physically go over and um, you know be in the US for the launch so I mean that hopefully we'll be able to do at a later date but at least um, yeah in New Zealand maybe we can do some local things later (laughs) (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) I mean actually Actually, that that does remind me of a, a question we have here, which is, um, you you set the book in in Los Angeles and here here in the states. So so, what made you decide that? And again, because you know we've been dealing with COVID all this time. What kind of research did you have to do with, over the city, if any, um, to kind of write all that? Yeah, good question. So I was I thought about this a lot, right? Because. I wanted it to be believable that this sub um, secret community of Korean witches, Korean diaspora witches would be thriving in this community somewhere in the world. And so in this world, I believe that there are Korean witches all over the world. But then I thought, where is the largest diaspora community? And um, they say, I don't know how accurate these figures are, but they say there are 7 million Korean diaspora community around the world. 7 million. That's quite a lot, right? Because the whole population of New Zealand is five. <laughs> <laughs> so seven is a lot. Um, and the largest uh, Korean diaspora community is in LA. So I thought, well, that has to be where it starts. The largest thriving community the biggest Korea town, um, I believe. So yeah, so I thought LA and I'd been to LA um, quite a few times and I I do love the city. The traffic is terrible, but um, (laughs) there are so many wonderful things about the city. Um, And I'd recently gone um, in 2018 as part of um, my honeymoon actually with my husband. We went to a a few different places, but we stopped by in LA. 
Wow. Um, so it was fresh in my mind. And so I did some online research, just, you know, distances and things, <laughs> um, <laughs> reminding myself where things were and distances and how, you know, if I was to ride Boris, how long would it take to get from A to B? Um, but yeah, that was it really. I just um, yeah, used a lot of online research in my memory. Wow. That is, that is really cool. Cause, cause I was wondering like if I, had to write a book set in a place different from where I live, like that would be like really difficult. But I think it was it was totally believable. Yeah. Um, I mean, Thank we're not you. LA like natives, but <laughs> <laughs> as non LA natives, it made total sense. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> um, uh, kind of a little bit of a side question, but is does does Boris have like a speed in mind, uh, or like how how does Boris work? <laughs> <laughs> how does Boris work yes um he is a little bit of a mystery but he is part dragon and he is part scooter so um I mean that kind of is what it is I guess I mean he has he's he's magical in part but ultimately he is a mode of transport um and I think it's described in the book as training wheels right so um because the middle clan have the super speed, but you can imagine a whole group of um, toddlers <laughs> running around at super <laughs> speed would probably not be great for society. Um, having, uh, currently raising a toddler, I can. Yeah, uh, I was going to say they're not, quick enough. <laughs> yeah, they're quick enough without super speed. Um, <laughs> so yeah, Boris um, and others like Boris are a good, great way for uh, for these young beetle protector witches to to learn and to test their speed before it becomes inherent in their own bodies. Wow. Kind of uh, a shift in topics, kind of a backtracking maybe a little bit, but uh, this is your debut novel. Um, and, and obviously like fantastic, <laughs> fantastic for a debut novel. It's amazing. Um, but can you tell us a little bit more about your journey getting here? Uh, were you always a writer um, was it something that you grew up with? I was not always a writer. I was definitely always a reader. I loved books. I just, I mean, I know you two also know this, but <laughs> books are special, right? Books are... Books are amazing. Oh, they're just entire worlds. They're like, you know, to take Carlos's lingo, I mean, they're all they're little universes. It's a multiverse of books. Every one leads you to a new place. And that is so powerful. So I've always loved books, but I have not been a writer. The only story uh, as a child I ever remember writing, just one, <laughs> was when I was 11. Um, and it was called The Multicolored Club. And it was a mashup between the Babysitter's Club and the Spice Girls. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't know what it was about. It was like my friends, we started a club and each of us had a name. So like, depending on your color. So I think I was midnight black um, and then somebody <laughs> was like racy red or something. And it all came with a persona, like Spice Girls came with a, po you know, each person had their own persona and it was a club just like the babysitter's club. And I think that was about it. I have no idea. What. <laughs> yeah. We, we yeah. need what to get our about. hands on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> I, just the, just the, the back of the last fallen moon. That's all we're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Extra content. Um, so, you yeah, know, that was the only writing I ever did. And in fact, at school, I don't know if I've ever... Uh, I mean, you guys might have heard the story, but um, I remember at school once the teacher gave us this this um, creative writing assignment where we had to write about our families and I was really excited I love my family um, and I was so excited to write the story about them I handed it in super proud of what I'd done and then the teacher pulled me aside afterwards having read it and said look this is a good piece of writing but I wanted mm. to ask you why you described your family as being blonde and blue-eyed and I remember being really confused and also really angry at the teacher. Like, what do you mean? Why? Of course, because it's a rule. Like, no matter what you look like in real life, no matter what your background or culture, in books, you have to be white. Like, that was the rule that I had internalized just purely because I had only ever read books about white people. So I just assumed that was how you, you wrote things, right? 
Um, and so, yeah, that was probably the two only memories of me writing anything as a kid. And it was only much later as an adult when I rediscovered books, I like lost touch with books for a really long time, just because as you guys are probably feeling already, school gets really busy <laughs> and <laughs> right, like assignments. School, and then there's so right. <laughs> I know. And you know, all respect to school, because school's really important, but the way that we're taught to write and produce things for school sometimes takes so much joy out of the reading and writing process that yeah. I don't know, I just lost my love for books for a really long time. Um, and then, yeah, as an adult, I one day discovered them. I was like, oh my gosh, books. <laughs> I remember books. this world. <laughs> Whoa. Um, and then I realized at that point that I had been invisible, right, on those, on those pages for so long. And I was so saddened by that. I was like, why? Like, why did no one tell me that, that we could exist on the page, but no one told us, no one showed us. And so we were like, I, I mean, the reason I got angry at my teacher was because I thought she was wrong. I was like, why are you telling me to do something that is wrong? Um, how, how messed up is that? That's, <laughs> and yeah, so, that's, yeah, to internalize it's, it's, it's crazy. the belief that you don't deserve to exist and then yeah. to fight other people for it when they say you should yeah, be on it's, the page. <laughs> it's, uh, it's something that I think your book is going to, your book and a lot of other books that uh, were released um, kind of around the same time. There's been a lot of great, great books um, in this, in kind of this kind of like little mini release cycle um, are definitely going to go a long way to change that. I think one of, that's one of the most powerful things about the Rick Riordan Presents imprint is that it, it allows people to, to be seen and allows to look at yourself in in the sort of book mirror I don't know if that makes any sense but you're you're Love reading that. the book and you're like hold on a second their family's just like my family they eat the food exactly. I eat they talk yeah. like I talk right and you know what it's not even if you are of the same culture and I think that's what's so cool is that um obviously for Korean diaspora kids reading this book they'll have a special affinity to it because they'll be so familiar with some of the things that she eats and, and says and does but for everybody else too it's 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 like a window in or like you say a mirror in to another way of life right like because we're so diverse you know in the city that I live in Auckland there are more than 206 languages spoken wow because that it's so diverse and then to think that in, yeah, this type of diverse world, we only have one like accepted mainstream narrative. That's just sad in terms of like the, the lack of storytelling diversity that we get, you know, at its pure simplicity. So anyway, so I was really <laughs> no, sad no, no. about it, you know, and then I decided to stop being um, whiny about it because I really hate whiny people and <laughs> I just thought I would just do something about it so I started writing as an adult it was a very very um late uh discovery um but yeah that's how I got writing and that's how the last fallen star kind of came about because of this desire but need to do something with the injustice I felt <laughs> mm -hmm. but also this desire this burning desire to share these awesome stories that I heard I was like oh my gosh people need to know about this stuff because it's cool <laughs> it is it is super cool and and I think this kind of uh comes into uh another one of the questions that we have uh, how do you make that transition from putting down stories on a page and and having an idea right and how does that become then like words either probably on a computer nowadays like how does that become words on a computer and how does that go from becoming words on a computer to becing books yeah and yeah, what was that process wild. like for yourself yeah so it was painful i guess is probably the main <laughs> word <laughs> um, i did a lot of rewriting of this book i mean when it first started off there were only two clans, not not six. Wow. Um, it was just the Kom clan and the Horangi clan um, because I had I had based it off the myth, right? So it started off as just the two, um, and then it went from there. 
Um, it was also a YA book, not middle grade. So it was completely Ooh. different. Mm. Yeah, it was completely <laughs> different. Um, and, and then it just changed and changed. I think I, I counted, I mean, I lost count, but I'm pretty sure I wrote it about 17 times. Wow. Um, re- That's yeah, crazy. it was a lot. It was a lot, <laughs> but I was kind of dog with a bone. I was like, I must make this work. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, but you know how I started? Um, I start this with all my stories is um, the keyboard doesn't quite do it for me when I'm in the brainstorming phase because I think the keyboard is in when I'm in production mode, like when I'm just like getting the story out. But I'm not one of those amazing creative people who can just sit there with a blank Word doc or I use Scrivener, the app, um, with just with like a blank cursor. I just can't produce like that. I need to know the story at least the skeleton of it in my head. So I have this like huge A3, is it A3? Well, two A4s are A3, right? Yeah. Yeah. I can a three sketch pad and I have all these colorful pens and I just sit down, I just like lie on the ground with all these colors and I just <laughs> blurt out things and stick them on the page, you know? So when I look back at some of my A3s when I was first starting the story, it's just like witches something cool about magic <laughs> um, <laughs> um, cool girl who learns something by the end of the book uh, you know it's like <laughs> random random things um, mythology remember that thing that Haimoni told me when I was little what was that about hmm um, <laughs> find out later so a lot of that yeah a lot of that um, and then I usually um, after the main brain dump I try to do like a flow chat So like a basic idea of where the story will go in the big beats, like she'll start here, she'll end here. And maybe these are the few big linchpin events or milestones that she'll go through during um, that change her, you know, where she learns something about herself and changes internally. And then the next big thing I do generally is how can I make her life terrible is the big question I ask. (laughs) How many horrible, (laughs) difficult challenges can I throw in her way? Because I think the sign of a good story is um, somebody being able to overcome all obstacles. And in order to do that, you have to give them the challenges to overcome. (laughs) So yeah, usually when I am, yeah, exactly. So when I'm um, doing my outlines, I usually have like a whiteboard or a corkboard um, behind, like in my eye vision above my computer where I put that line. How much S-H-I-T can I throw at my character? And I keep that as a reminder (laughs) um, throughout the outlining process. And then, yeah, and then I just sit there and try to write. (laughs) <laughs> and um, it was really painful, like I said. But, you know, one thing I have definitely learned is that writing is not solitary. Um, I always used to think that writers just kind of went into their cave and wrote their masterpieces um, <laughs> and then came out and it was like, da-da, it's done. Uh, but no, it's definitely not the case. And um, when I had a pretty polished manuscript, I entered a mentoring program called Author Mentor Match. Um, And if you apply with your manuscript, um, there's a bunch of agented or published authors that will um, go through all the submissions. And if they like something, they'll pick you and decide to mentor you and help you make that manuscript better. And so I did that. Um, I actually entered that with an old manuscript, a previous story. Um, And my mentor picked me, said, you're onto something, but I think this story is is dead. I think you should move on to something (laughs) new. (laughs) Um, And this is what I'd moved on to. So she helped me um, bring the first draft of The Last Fallen Star to life. It wasn't even called The Last Fallen Star. It went through like a hundred different names. Um, and And then what did I do? I had lots of friends help critique it. And then I entered DV Pitch. Um, It's the Twitter pitch contest where you can pitch your manuscript in a tweet. And if agents and editors are interested, they heart it. Um, And then you basically get to the top of the line to avoid the slush pile and you can get to the, get their attention faster, basically. So I did that. I found my agent that way. Um, And then she and I went through more revisions. uh, And then we went out and we went out to um, a few different publishing houses. And Hannah, uh, Hannah, 
Elliman, who's now Hannah Hill, she was at Disney Hyperion. She's um, now gone to a different publishing house, but she found The Last Fallen Star um, and she liked it, but she said, um, I have a different vision for it. Would you be willing to revise it? And so we revised it. And part of that was making it, it uh, middle grade. <laughs> so we did that. It was a huge revision and I loved it. Her ideas were incredible. Uh, we did it. And then she came back. She saw it. She came back and she said, you know what? I'd like to offer the offer on this. We'd like to make this into a real book. Um, and by the way, we'd like to make it a Rick Ryden Presents book. What? what? No way. And I died. <laughs> I died. I, died. <laughs> I actually died. So the day that I got the news, I was, I had just had my blood taken. Oh um, no! Because I, was, because I was pregnant, and I was like super woozy and kind of like oh, no. lightheaded from the blood taken, and I was lying on this clinic bed having my twelve week belly like what do you call it ultrasounded to see yeah, my yeah. baby for the first time, and then I got this news, and I was like, I can't handle. There's too many things happening today. <laughs> too <laughs> so, yeah. much excitement. <laughs> it's a long story, but that's. Yeah, that's how it happened. Wow. wow. That that sounds so awesome. What a um, what an amazing process. If, yeah. I kind of I kind of want to dive back into kind of what you're talking about with the plotting process because something that really I I loved about the book was kind of the murder mystery subplot that you kind of had um and it, there's there's so many <laughs> twists uh and turns so I, I was wondering how like at what point were you able to figure out all those all those different twists and how that was all going to come together? So I, um, like I said before, I'm a firm outliner. I have a terrible memory, and I even on the road, I'm terrible. I, I get lost all the time. <laughs> like I'm always lost. Um, so I need a firm map. So I outline all those twists and things at the very beginning. I even do um, pretty. Uh, oh, actually, these days I do a little less, but I usually even like to outline how a chapter starts and ends because oh, wow. I love reading books where at the end of the chapter, you think, I'll just read till the end of the chapter, but mm -hmm. then I'll close the book. I just want to read till the end of the chapter. <laughs> you get to the end of the chapter and you're like, oh, I'll just read one more page, <laughs> one more page. <laughs> I love those cliffhangery things at the end of the chapters. So um, I... I, yeah, I try to emulate some of the things that I love in books um, that are page turners. So yeah, I, I try to plot um, as much of that out as I can. But funnily enough, something I've discovered is that there's something kind of magical that happens when you write. You've got all the plans there um, and you've got all the stories sorted out, but sometimes things happen. Like the characters tell you stuff that they want to do that wasn't your plan um, or they... <laughs> 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 for listeners, I'm seeing Diego's eyes go um, Or, yeah, they just, the plot takes me on journeys that I hadn't previously imagined. Um, in the heat of the moment, things change. Um, and that's, I think, the joy of writing in amongst the pain of writing, because at some point, your characters come alive. I don't know. I don't know how that happens. Um, and then you go on a little bit of a converse like a conversation journey with them where they say, how about we do this instead, boss? Um, okay. <laughs> I'll give that a go. Um, so yeah, there is a little bit of mysterious magic involved as well, I think. Wow. Kind of a little bit focused uh, on something similar. Like, are there any times where your character tells you something and you're like, ah, <laughs> I'm not really yes. sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> all the time, all the time. Um, I found um, of all my characters in The Last Fallen Star, um, Emmett. Emmett always tried to move things in a direction I didn't want to go. And I think it's because <laughs> as a character, Emmett is so risk adverse and so safe and he's such a voice of reason. So I think he just kept wanting to hijink, uh, hijink the story and prevent it from going down the terrible tumultuous paths that I wanted to <laughs> go down. He was like, no, 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 we, we should not do that. Um, yeah, he was probably a bit of a trouble Taking maker. Hattie to the middle of nowhere to perform a dangerous spell? That's not a yeah. good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to yeah. stop you right there. <laughs> that is so cool. Um, and 
another kind of similar question is obviously uh, it is a uh, Rick Riordan presents book. Um, and, and you have all these amazing people, um, around you, helping you out, uh, giving you feedback. Uh, what was it like working with Rick Riordan? Oh, wow. Yeah. Uncle Rick, eh? Um, (laughs) (laughs) I honestly, I say this all the time, but I don't really have words because, I still today, I woke up this morning and I said to my husband, I said, Neil, I'm going to go talk to the Half-Blood Report today. You know how much I love those guys. And how is this my real life? How is it that I have this book that Rick Ryden, aka God, you know, (laughs) non-human person, picked my random story of all the stories out there, I'm some nobody in this small island nation in the middle of nowhere. Like, how did this happen? Um, so I don't really have words except to say that I think Rick is a god and I think he <laughs> is put on earth to spread the joy of storytelling to all humankind. Um, and I just feel so blessed to work with him. And he's, I mean, as you guys know, he's so gracious. He's so generous. He's so kind yeah, very nice. and he's funny and he's all of the above. <clears throat> and he has above all created, obviously with the queen, AKA Steph, um, created this incredible <laughs> Stephanie. <family. laughs> <Stephanie. clears throat> Stephanie, yeah. Um, and the entire Disney team. I mean, the entire Disney team team is incredible I have just had such joy working with everybody in that in that team Uh, we joke that well I joke that there should be a seventh clan um it should be the Disney clan um, we should have (laughs) some kind of super powers Um, (laughs) but I think one of the coolest parts of what Rick has created um with the team is this family you know, because everybody in the entire team, the, the Disney team and all the Rick Ryden Presents authors are so nice and everybody's so supportive. Um, and that part of it has just been a joy because, you know, I'm a debut author. I'm really new to this. Um, and especially as somebody who doesn't live in the US, um, you know, it's it's hard to feel like you're part of something from so far away. Mm. Um, but everybody's been so welcoming and I have to say this also includes the entire Riordanverse and the Percyverse and podcasts like yours oh, and others and the fandom. I mean, everybody has just been so welcoming. Um, and I've, <clears throat> sorry, my throat today. <laughs> it's um, all right. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Maybe it's just me getting teary. Um, but everybody's been so incredibly welcoming. And so I am just going for um, this incredible ride with all of you. And I think that's the part I've loved so much is that, yes, it's my name on the front, but I feel like this has been um, a journey shared with so many people, um, including you two. So anyway, well, you, got, you, got, you got the uh, amazing acknowledgement section, so. <laughs> The acknowledgement section has a lot of praise for the people you work with. Um, But yeah, I think kind of relating it to your book, the book talks a lot about fitting in and belonging as part of a community and, and with friends and with kind of school and social environments. And uh, how does Riley navigate this and how does that compare to how you would navigate it and And like, how did you choose this theme to focus on? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, it's universal, right? Like, I think we all yearn to belong um, because I think we're human and we're designed that way. We're social creatures, right? Even though I'm actually, I'm pretty much an introvert, but I do (laughs) do appreciate that we are social creatures. Um, And it's something that was very dear to me because growing up, I, even though I had a wonderful childhood, I really did, you know, loving family and good friends and good community. I always still felt like I never belonged. And I really wanted to explore that. Like, why is it that despite, despite having somewhat of um, an external validation to say that you do belong, why is it that so many of us still feel like an outsider? Like, what is that? Like, how is it that that comes about? 
Um, and what can we do to not feel that way? Is there something we can do to not feel that way? So I guess that's where it started. Um, and the biggest feeling of not belonging when I was a child was this idea of this um, dual Korean Kiwi identity. Because in mm -hmm. Korea, when we used to go back to see family, everybody always said, well, you're not really Korean. You know, you look Korean, but you don't dress like us. You don't really talk like us. Like you're different. And so I always felt like in a sea of people that were technically my people, I felt like a sore thumb. Like I just, you know, I was different. Yeah. And in New Zealand, for the most part, I was welcomed. Um, but, you know, there were regular cases where I was reminded I wasn't, you know, and kids used to spit in my lunch and throw stones at me. I remember these two guys mm. used to chase me home all the time on their bikes. Like I, I didn't have a bike. I used to walk and they used to chase me on their bikes, like taunting me and telling me to leave their country and calling me horrible racist slurs. And, and, you know, like nothing terrible happened. Like there are terrible things happening to people today, you know? Um, and I didn't yeah. face any kind of real danger that affected my life or my livelihood or anything like that but these small microaggressions over time I guess lead you to believe that they're right you know that maybe you don't deserve to belong that maybe you are an outsider and so it took me a really long time to come to appreciate that actually what makes us different can can be an asset and not a liability yeah but it took a while and sometimes I still get confused um not necessarily just between my Korean and Kiwi identities but all the other identities that we have right because we're such complex beings like we're we're just like onions we just have layers and layers of different things that make us who we are and I yeah I guess I wanted Riley to go on that journey to maybe shed light for others who might be feeling the same way, that there is a way. Um, external validation is important, that it's no excuse for other people to do terrible things because there is no excuse for that. But, <clears throat> but true belonging, I, I genuinely believe, has to first start with us, like inside. Because if you don't accept and love yourself, then no one else can, right? Like if you're not putting out the example then how can you accept it from others? So I guess that's part of the journey I wanted Riley to go on. Um, and it was a little bit like self-therapy for me, <laughs> like <laughs> processing things that I went through and then also saying to other people, hey, look, there's this way of looking at it that maybe we can first learn to love ourselves and then invite others to love us and accept us too. Because, you know, one of the things I love about really confident people you know there's people who like walk through life just on on it like I don't know how else to describe <laughs> they just demand they demand attention and they demand respect you know and it's in the way that they hold themselves it's in the way that they project themselves to the world and those people get respect you know like because they demand it because they emulate it and so I think that was part of the lesson I wanted to teach myself through Riley and to share with others that we need to demand it. We need to be more, um, yeah, we need to be more demanding about what we deserve in this world and what should be in this world because kindness is so lacking, I think. And it is the easiest thing to do. Being kind is so easy if we want to. You're so wow. right. And, and, I, and I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I'm so sorry those things happened to you. Um, and while well, well, I've never experienced anything like what's happening today all across the world or what's happened to you, I would say I, I have also kind of felt, um, you know, not being sure between, you know, being my Peruvian heritage and, you know, being born and raised here. And well, I think what I'm glad is that I, I was born in a day and age where I was able to, you know, come to the lesson that Riley learns like much earlier in my life. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I'm just even more glad that this, that this book is, is also out there to, to also be a way to help, you know, people who may have been struggling, what I struggle with when you struggle with, you know, come to that realization a lot sooner. 
um, so they don't have to do uh, self therapy and and you know <laughs> and write a whole oh, book about it. <laughs> though, though, getting paid for therapy is is much better than what usually happens. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, much better than paid for it. <laughs> That's so true. Here, uh, look at this. I made this book for you. It's yours. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I think that is one of the one of the really powerful messages um, of this book is that it it kind of shows you how Riley is neither a, a, a gum. I don't know if I'm pronouncing yes. that one right. Yes, um, no, or yeah, a horangi. Really horangi. <laughs> yes, very well. Yeah, I got it. I got it. <laughs> okay. Um, and and neither is she a Saram, right? She's kind of like yeah. in between all these things, but she has the ability to to she knows enough about these different parts of herself that she can affect that change and that she can she can be there for other people and be powerful without necessarily having literal magic powers. Um, and, and I think that's something that's really cool, because in a lot of books, you see characters who have magic powers and they're like shooting things and you're like, oh, well. I don't have magic powers, right? But in this book, it's a lot about like, oh, wow, she got magic powers. Oh, wow, she doesn't need magic powers. I don't need magic powers. I can be like Riley. Um, and, oh, and be, I love that you... <laughs> be I magic without having that. to be magic. <laughs> yes, yes. That was exactly what, um, what I wanted to say was that magic is awesome. And to be honest, if I ever had the chance of getting magic, I will say yes. I mean, let's be honest about that. <laughs> if, we, if we can have magic, we should have magic. Um, but also true magic <laughs> is about our actions, right? It's about what we do with ourselves. It's what we do with our, um, our freedom of choice. Like that's where real magic is. Um, and then the other magical powers, that's just bonus. That's just, that's just the extra cool stuff, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that, that stuff isn't necessary. It's, it's you yeah. that matters. One, exactly. We're all magic. We're all stardust. <laughs> so you you wrote you know an amazing plot and an amazing uh, you know uh, you know emotional through line that I that we've been giving you lots of praise on. But something that you, we also desperately need to praise you on is your mastery of the Easter eggs because there are so <laughs> many here, and I just I just wanted to hear you know uh, how, how you kind of came up with all those and and you know what was the story behind that. Yeah, so I love Easter eggs. I love any hint in a story that um, that connects to a wider universe. I just think that's so cool because we were talking about multiverses before, but because that tells me that these incredible worlds could be connected. Ooh. I mean, how? I know. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, Curse I mean, Carnival. Is, <laughs> yes, coming exactly. later. I can't wait for that. Um, <laughs> I have it somewhere anyway um yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> um so I love Easter eggs I put in in the original drafts I put in a lot of Percy Jackson Easter eggs and Stephanie at one point in her notes in a very lovely diplomatic way said I think we have enough <laughs> 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 um so there may have been one or two that we've removed um but yes, I, I got to leave a few in there. And actually, I also have a few Easter eggs for my friends' books as well. Mm, so in yes. the taming of the Im Myeong-jo scene, there's, um, I have this wonderful writing group of fellow Korean diaspora writers. There's five of us. Um, and all of us started off uh, when we first met each other completely unagented. We had just all started our writing journeys. And now all of us are agented and we all have books um, coming out or in the process of being announced. So it's, it was kind of like a little nod to our little pod of, um, of family writers. And so, yeah, I put random things in there. Um, for them. <laughs> but if other people pick them up, that's awesome too. So yeah, no, I love Easter eggs. I have to say the, the one that made me chuckle the most was the Casper one. I just... <laughs> I like I like the gamer tag one. Yeah, <laughs> that one was funny. Oh. But no, it was it was definitely super cool. Actually, this is this is kind of like a side question, more me questions, not in our script. Um, how did you decide to incorporate a video game into all this? Because I, I felt like 
like when I first heard about it, um, when uh, when Riley kind of mentions who Emmett is, it's like, oh, yeah, he's very cool. He also plays this game that he's obsessed with. I was like, oh, wow, that's like that's pretty cool. Like that'll probably never come up again. And then it was like a big giant like like there was a, there was a plot point over here. There was plot points going on over there. There was references all throughout. Um, it, it, Disney's working on that, right? <laughs> that'd be cool um okay i will be honest i have no idea how that came about like i just i have no memory i mean i mentioned it before i have a terrible memory i have the memory of a sieve like i don't remember anything like i don't remember what i wrote what i ate yesterday or what i did yesterday um so i have no recollection <laughs> of why the video game was a thing Except, <gasps> no, I really don't. You had us there for a second. I, <laughs> if I remember anything, I'll let you know. Right now. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was it so been like Emmett just telling me. <laughs> yeah, um, there was, there was something like I was, I was waiting for it. The suspense, it was building this crush <laughs> in an instant. <laughs> so I think we, we definitely have to ask, what can you tell us? please about books please. two and three <laughs> okay um last fallen moon yes the last fallen moon the second book which i am currently editing at the moment uh what can Ooh. i say i can say that um it's a good this book. is always a chill <laughs> oh, I, I hope it's okay <laughs> um I don't know what I can say. What can I mean? Can I be open? okay? Yeah, I'll be open about it. Okay, so um, Riley goes on a journey. Mm. She goes somewhere, um, <laughs> and it's really far away, but it seems much closer and further away at the same time. If that kind of makes sense, um, I would like to say that you two may enjoy where they go. Uh, what else can I say? Um, <laughs> that makes me nervous also. Uh, what else can I say? I think, oh, there'll be lots of other cool new um, mythical, uh, sorry, my, yeah, mythological, mythical Korean creatures that uh, feature mm. in the story. Um, uh, Riley finds... Oh no, I can't. I can't. I can't. <laughs> uh, don't worry. Don't I, worry. It's okay. I think. Yeah. I think we got enough. We got it. Well, yeah, Riley, okay. Thanks for telling us uh, what, what you could. Um, Riley. Yeah, Riley okay. is in the book. She goes to a place. It's a cool yeah. place. There's cool creatures. Yeah. It's a cool book. Pre-order it. Okay. So <laughs> I don't think that's possible. Great yet. summary. Great summary. <laughs> for people listening to this in like I don't know what four months. Pre-order it. <laughs> um, so um uh, but yeah i think i think well, as a person um, another yeah, thing yeah. that you probably can't tell us a lot oh. about is that we we read in your mailbag that oh, yeah disney channel but oh, by the way everyone should subscribe to your mailbag subscribe but disney channel <laughs> has option the gifted clans for a live action tv series so i don't yeah. know if you can tell us anything about that but we definitely want to know what your reaction was when you heard that news yeah, I, again, I died again, which can that happen <laughs> if I already died the first time I found out that book was published? Um, yeah, no, I love uh, TV. I love movies. I just think um, some of my biggest inspirations for, for stories come from the screen because I think screen has that way of capturing things really essentially. Um, so, I, yeah, I love TV. So when I heard that it was optioned, obviously when something gets optioned, there's a huge journey that it has to go through before it can even become um, anything if it comes to life. But the possibility is now there, so that's really exciting. Um, what I do know is that there is a script writer attached to it, a screenwriter, I should say. Oh, is that the same thing, screenwriter, script writer? Mm. Yeah. Um, I, uh, he is awesome and he and I have been in conversation and I understand where things are at is he's finished the script for the pilot and it is currently with the powers that be at um, the Disney Channel for consideration. So I believe now we just wait and wait and wait um, in the black hole that is the black hole of entertainment um, and then we just see what happens but 
who knows i guess we'll see wouldn't that be exciting yeah that would be yes. awesome <laughs> please that would be so cool please. yeah well hopefully yeah. it doesn't take as long as the percy jackson tv show <laughs> <laughs> it might <laughs> we'll see but how cool so much movement happening on there yeah yes. that universe that Whoa. is very very exciting well i was i was gonna say what's happened to you is very fast so far so that's awesome um yeah it's it's a it's a good sign um and i feel like before before we continue uh we we have to start wrapping up we're gonna ask our final questions in a little bit um backtracking a little bit to the book two and three thing you've said what you could but as as a representative of the fandom, I feel like I'm obliged to ask about. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, OK. Um, in, book two, in book two. Uh, oh, no, is oh, no, possibly in book two for reasons that are beyond what you may think it is. But Ooh. um Complications, I'll say. Okay. Sounds like a big oh no. <laughs> no, oh, oh, like Diego, oh, no. please. <laughs> we'll keep making puns about that forever. Because I will <laughs> laugh about that forever. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right, all right. Okay, sorry. On Samuel, last can Samuel, I just, continue. Can I add a story? Yes, please. Um, I have a friend whose last name is Kim. And she fell in love with a man whose last name is Chi. And <gasps> uh, yeah, and <laughs> she hyphenated her her last name with his. And so her last name became Kim Chi. <laughs> <laughs> it is the best thing ever. It is the most Korean that... <laughs> pride last name there ever was. Yeah. That feels that feels like it was a match made in heaven. <laughs> it really was. Definitely was. Or a match yeah. made in the kitchen. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's kitchen. more like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, um, Samuel, take it away. Oh yeah. Uh, so uh, here are our last two questions. Um, two. Oh my god. Uh, I, was, I was gonna say so, so <laughs> the first one. Uh, we're, we're, I I guess what what I'm asking. We kind of have discussed this earlier, but mm -hmm. how do you hope? Like, if there was one takeaway from the book what would you hope that would be for all the kids reading it? Yeah. Mm, yeah. I mean, I talked about that idea of belonging, having to start within ourselves and the idea of magic being in all of us. We were all born to shine. Um, but I guess if there was one thing I would want readers to take away, it's the recognition of the power of our choices. Um, you know, like so much of this world seems big and bad and scary. And I don't think that changes when you become an adult. In fact, I feel more scared now as an adult than I did <laughs> when I was younger about so many things. Um, but I find that um, we can do so much in the small actions, right? Like the small things that we do. Um, yeah, they really have the power to change people's lives and to to change our own lives. So yeah, the power of choice, what we decide to say, what we decide to do, what we decide to stand up for. Um, I think that's probably the big message. Yeah. Wow, that is, it's a that's very amazing. powerful message. Yes. Um, to, to share with and it's a all powerful the people book overall, so. who are, who are going to get your book. Thanks, guys. And yeah and we did want to end on some 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 like something lighthearted. <laughs> so uh we have to ask well it's been two a little bit over two uh two weeks a week um since the book came out a week and a bit i think yeah yeah, yeah. so what so far has been the best fan interaction you've had online oh mm. uh, okay uh uh, okay, well, first of all, I've had so many wonderful people reach out to say wonderful things that have made me cry every single time because <laughs> I also suffer from leaky uh, bladder eyeball syndrome. It may be something <laughs> I pulled from my own life. Um, but one thing I, two, I'll say two stories, two stories I love. 
One is um, somebody who emailed uh, the day after the book released, I think, or was it even the day of release? No, it must've been the day after, just to say that um, they loved the book um, and asked lots of questions about um, the title of guessing the title of the third book, um, wanting to know if there was romance involved, um, wanting to know the intricacies of what would happen if um, uh, somebody was born to parents of two different clans and would they have the <gasps> choice to, yeah, to choose which clan to initiate into? Like really in-depth questions about the world, which I loved hearing. That was one. The other was from actually a parent who said that they um, have been uh, having not very good relationships with their tween age son because he has suddenly decided that she's not cool enough for, <laughs> for him um, and that she bought him this book and he read it and her name was mentioned in the acknowledgments and suddenly he mm. was acting like his mom was the coolest person <laughs> and I was like, whoa, I feel like I helped do that. I helped make the mom cooler. <laughs> um, so that was pretty cool. <laughs> when your mom's name is in the book, you know they're cool. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, that awesome. that's that's really fun um but yeah we want to thank you so much for coming on to the podcast uh, and um thank you for listening as yeah well. for, for listening thanks to uh, neil <laughs> <laughs> neil <laughs> um oh he'll be so happy <laughs> thank you so much you've you've given um, some amazing answers um and some things for people to think about yeah and, and, and i so think much. that's that's important and we hope to to talk to you all about yes. the last fallen moon the last so. fallen moon. I can't wait. It's Everything about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Like I said, I'm huge fans. I will continue to listen um, dutifully and enjoy hearing your voices all the time. So thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Well, thank, thank you. you. I'm Gracie Kim, the author of The Last Fallen Star with Rick Ryden Presents. If you listen to the Half-Blood Report, Emmett Harrison will come and feed you salted caramel cookies until you die of cookie overdose. <laughs>